All right, thank you so much for staying with the Monday Report Town Hall session. This is your show where your voice comes first. Use the hashtag Monday Report at Trevor on Bidget Citizen TV Kenya. We'll sample some of your views. My panelists are still here with me. We're talking about the war on corruption. I'd like them to listen to the sentiments of Kenyans who sent in their videos, and then I'll go through some of your Twitter response here. Keep it coming at Monday uh, as using the hashtag Monday Report. Listen to what some of you had to say who sent in their videos. They say actions speak louder than words. In this country, we have had the discussion of the fight against corruption for quite a long time. People have been talking about this, uh, including the president, including other senior officials in government, but we haven't seen much action being taken to deal with uh, this vice once and for all. We still hear of scandals, major scandals being mentioned, but we haven't seen prosecution of the same. Therefore, we want to see more of prosecution, more of action-based kind of fight against this crime and less of press conferences that do not yield anything at the end. Hi, my name is Alan Akuno from Nairobi County. First and foremost, I'd like to appreciate the work being done by the Office of the DPP and the EACC. You guys are doing a good job. Keep it up for the first time you have seen prosecution of high-profile cases. A good example is Member of Parliament John Waluke, former CS Chris Wahungu. That was an amazing, amazing job. And now to my question to all the panelists. What do you think are some of the factors affecting prosecution of corruption cases in Kenya? Thank you. There has been over 20 mega scandals for the last 25 years where we have seen billions and billions of taxpayers' money being plundered by very high-profile people. Not a single one has ever been jailed with courts citing reasons like lack of enough evidence. What now guarantee is there that this time around there is seriousness because it is said the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Is BBI addressing this? Shall we ever, ever have guys being jailed? Two ways we can win the, the war against corruption. Number one, empower the institutions that are interested to fight the corruption with independence. Number two, let the politician lead by example. The only time we will win this war is the time when Kenya will have leaders who will be selfless, who will not consider themselves but will put the public first. That is the time when we will win war on corruption. Now, mm -mm. Madam Kamau, you've had the sentiments of the people and most of them are heading towards the prosecution. So one of them actually asked you to give the factors affecting prosecution as to why it is not happening fast enough. Your response to that. Okay, thank you very much, Trevor. First and foremost, uh, at least I've heard one Kenyan saying that we've taken uh, big fish to court in the name of governors, in the name of MPs. In fact, we've gotten one convicted. We have CS CSs, that is cabinet secretaries, mm. who are facing corruption charges in court. Well, what I would admit is that maybe the process is slow, but we are moving towards it. Because at least the time is shortening. It, it did not take very long before Waluke was convicted. We, we did it with other two years. And I'm hoping even the other cases that we've taken to court, we'll do even in a rest of time. Yeah. I've said we have got challenges, but we are also not just folding our hands and saying we have got challenges. Like Shira said, we have invested now in getting some expert. Between us and the investigative agencies, we can get our, our evidence and we do get, especially in major cases, like if there are financial reports, instead of a prosecutor struggling with that document, that document to pierce them together, we got a financial expert to come and put the whole story and have the case pressed before the court. I remember we had a case even with insurance experts and we yeah. got an insurance expert packaging the case so that when I, the prosecutor, got to court, the, all I have to do is get the expert stand in the dock mm. and give the whole story to the court instead of having to get several witnesses to testify. So that will cut the time taken between the prosecution and up to the time we close our case yeah. and the conviction. And then again, we are not just taking cases to court because people out there are paying for the blood of the suspect. Like for instance, if, like you talked about Kemsa yeah. and the 
number of companies concerned. We have to get all those documents scanned. We go through them properly. We get experts to package the reports so that when the DPP makes the decision to charge, yeah. we, we have a watertight case. And by the time we press it before the court, we are not struggling, telling yeah. the court, give us an adjournment to go and get this and this. As, as soon as we land in court, we are ready to move. Yeah. And you know, nowadays, uh, when you charge a person, you are supposed to charge uh, to serve them with the prosecution docket. That is, you you serve them with all the documents that you intend to rely on. Yeah. So by the time you are going to court, we are going to court now, ready that even if you are told proceed tomorrow, we will proceed. Mm -hmm. Again, we have been working with the courts in what we call the CUC. That is the court users committee, yeah. giving our problems because even the courts we ask ourselves. Why are the cases taking so long? And how can we shorten the period that, that is the, the, it's the courts are taking to hear all these cases? Yeah. If it's the witnesses who we are having problem with, the DPP has started a program where we facilitate the witnesses yeah. so that you are able to bring your witnesses, even if they are coming from Kisumu, uh, Northern Kenya or where, yeah. bring them to Nairobi, uh, supply them, accommodate them, mm -hmm. and keep them, and they are ready to pro, uh, to testify. Yeah. And when we, they come to testify, the court also we have to be ready to hear them, yeah. so that they won't get fatigued, witness fatigue that have come ten times and have not been heard. Okay. So we are trying to do that. Right. We are working together with the invest, the DCI, the in, the EACC, that yeah. is the investigative agencies, to ensure that they also avail these witnesses okay. in time and I failed the document. Shira talked about the researchers. Yeah. Currently, the DPP has also employed the researchers so that by the time the prosecutor or mm -hmm. the state council is appearing in court, he's not the one struggling also to go and get this and that authority. Yeah. The research is already done for them yeah. and it's packaged. We also have prosecution teams. Uh, we don't leave a council to do the case alone. We have a team of senior advocates, middle level, and junior advocates uh, so that even if one counsel is not, let's say he's unwell or for yeah. some reason he's not able to attend court, the matter will not be put off. The mm -hmm. matter will still continue. Right. So we are really working on that. The DPP has come up with the Prosecutors Trading Institute yeah. because like we've been told, these cases are, uh, they are changing, mutating every time. The way corruption used to be done in the past yeah. through checks. It's no longer it's the, the case today. Now it's the press of a button and hundreds of millions will be moved. Okay. Uh, we are partnering with uh, other countries outside our jurisdiction to yeah. assist us. If the money is, is in the Cayman Islands or some other places in Switzerland, yeah. we partner with them so okay. that they are able to give us information. All right. Sometimes it might take a bit, people might be a bit patient that they are waiting for this case to be charged. Mm. But behind the pictures, we are doing all that. We are networking. Yeah. We are getting information, what we call mutual legal assistance. Other yeah. countries assisting us in knowing where the money is. Yeah. We are getting ex experts, even if it's from outside the country, to help us package our case. Okay. And even the the, rock, the local experts. All right. So that we are not we are changing the way prosecution was done in the past. In the past and now. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Moniki, you know, institutions have been empowered enough. What is that one thing that you'd still want as an institution to empower you even further for your work to be more efficient? Is it a matter of lack of goodwill, bureaucracy with other investigation agencies? What is the missing link here? What is the problem? Okay, l l let me say this, that uh, first of all, the debate about uh, corruption in Kenya, the way I see it from my own perspective, it is a question of whether the, the grass is half full or half empty. Mm -hmm. because so much has been done but so much remains to be done yeah and this is where all of us need to come in so that we can fill in the grass now i say this because at five or six when i was preparing to come here i received like a call from a friend of mine saying how much do you pay if we for reporting a case of corruption and i said i did hear properly said how much do you pay for his brewing and i said honestly and this is the problem that we have Mm -hmm. We are looking at it that this fight is for ECC. Now, for us to be able to win, all of us must work together. And the citizens, especially in terms of reporting corruption, yeah. I say this because from our research, about over 50% of Kenyans don't report, don't report corruption. Then we also need authentic leaders. 
we are the ones who put our leaders in office. We are the ones who elect our MPs, our governors, our MCAs. Now, as Kenyans, let's put the people of good moral character in office. Because if you have the right person yeah. in an institution, it will be very difficult for people to steal. Because that person will be actually be on the side of ESCC in the fight against corruption. Mm. So we are having a lot of uh, interagency collaboration between all the agencies in the fight against corruption. We also, I want to thank Kenyans because again, we receive a lot of uh, uh, reports, but let all of us realize that for us to win the war against corruption, for Singapore to win the war against corruption and the other countries, the agencies played their part, but also the citizens have to play their part. Okay. Yes. Let me bring in Dr. Mado on this. And Dr. Mado, you know, the theme this year is recover with integrity. What does that even mean? Well, it means that basically we need we need uh, to recover in a V shape. So hopefully uh, we'll recover in a V shape in Kenya, but we need to recover with stronger systems in place. And how do we get stronger systems in place? I, I would mention two factors. One, we need to start identifying together. And I agree with the commissioner. I see the, the, the glass half full, uh, half full. So we need to start thinking about how do we mitigate corruption risks? And while one way to do it is to really start doing away with hidden contracts, overpricing, you know, collusion. How do we do that? By bringing full digital solutions in procurement processes. Number two, I agree also with the commissioner and with ODPP. We need to bring the private sector and the civil society. We need to be all together. Not only ODPP, DCI, the government, the judiciary, uh, and UNODC has been uh, supporting an initiative called the Blue Company Initiative, whereby we are supporting 500 top blue companies in Kenya to get certified by UNODC on the implementation of the convention. We are also supporting in getting a whole network of uh, oversight and compliance officers. So when in a private company you see a case of corruption, you can already report the case because you know what you are talking about. So we need the private sector to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, along with the civil society and especially the youth. All right. Uh, Sheila, you know, I saw a report on your website earlier on that said that more than 67% of people live, believe that corruption has increased over the last 12 months. What is the difference between this perception and the reality on the ground, really? It's not, it's, not, it's not much different. Um, this, was, uh, this was a county governance status report and also the bribery index, uh, which shows that 66% of Kenyans feel that corruption has increased in the last year. And further 55% opined that it will increase in the next one year. And, and really perceptions are, are driven by reality, what they see on the ground. Um, and, and one of the reasons when you ask Kenyans, why do you think corruption has increased? Or why do you think it is, you know, why, why would they say that it's likely to, or they project it to increase in the, in, in the future, is largely because they don't see that demonstrable change in the fight against corruption. I talked about the need to show results. The true results in the fight against corruption, when we are talking about, if we're talking about enforcement, is that people are, are uh, convicted, and the, the, the prison terms are commensurate to, their, to the crime that they have committed, the amounts of monies uh, that they have stolen from Kenyans. And the other true, res, uh, true measure of uh, success in the fight against corruption is that we're recovering the resources that we have lost. And as much as I, I, I would like to acknowledge our various agencies, the ESCC, the Asset Recovery Agency, I think in the last few years, we've seen them you know, increase the amounts of resources uh, being recovered and repatriated back into the economy. But when you look at what we are recovering, vis-a-vis -vis what we are losing, it's, it's really a drop in the ocean. So there's much more we need to do to ensure that we are recovering what we have lost. Because these are the real, uh, real measures of success in regard to enforcing um, the, the fight against corruption. So when Kenyans don't see that, you know, they're, they're not seeing people being punished. Yes, I agree. We've seen high-ranking officials being arraigned in court. And, and But again, the wheels of justice seem to be moving a little bit too slowly for Kenyans 
And I think, yes, we have we understand some of those challenges, but I think it's time that our institutions, which are responsible, um, just come together. I know that there are various efforts to bring together these institutions in the anti-corruption justice chain, like the multi-agency team. Yeah. You know, they also yeah. have the National Council on, on Administration of Justice. And, and um, Madam Emily has also talked about the corruption court users committees. And these are important to really bring institutions together to be able to, to, to raise the, some of those challenges they are facing in regard to, 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 to prosecution and, and, and hearing and determination of cases and so on. But I think um, we, we, we need to just get those wheels moving a little bit faster because on average, it has, we, in, from our own research, it takes about four to five years uh, to, to, to prosecute a corruption case. This is way too long. And you've had what Madam Emily has said. Within those four to five years, the things that 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 that, that happen, you know, a witness will die. They will they will uh, some dis you know there are just things that happen that then make make uh, make it very easy for that corruption case uh, to be defeated. Yeah. But then if we yeah. then be able to just bring the average uh, length of time that it is, takes to be able to prosecute that corruption case so under two years, she's talked about you know the model Waluke case. That would be good to just give Kenyans that hope that impunity does not. Um, that will not win, will not emerge victor in the fight against corruption. I think the other reasons why Kenyans feel and uh, frustrated yeah. in the fight against corruption, as I mentioned, there's an issue about the level of impunity because people are not going, are not being punished uh, fast enough. And then I think generally our anti-corruption journey has been one of fits and starts. You yeah. know, today we are hopeful, our hopes are rising, the next day they are falling, because then something has happened, maybe someone has been acquitted and so on. And, and this keep on denting the public confidence. And once the public confidence is, is dented, um, then that public support, and we really need the public support to be able to fight corruption. Commissioner Gashoka has talked about the, the, the number of people who are reporting corruption cases. Actually, from our more recent research, um, only 13% of Kenyans who come face to face with a corruption case, who witness a corruption case, will report. That yeah. is far too little. So that means that we are not even netting the corruption cases that are actually happening. We're not even able to prevent these yeah. cases. Yeah. One of the reasons, again, is that many Kenyans do not feel protected sufficiently to be able to come forth with cases of corruption. Okay. We don't have a block protection um, law in place at the moment. There's yeah. one that has, a draft bill has been pending for the past seven years. There seems to be very little political commitment uh, to, to enact that law. But if we really want people to come forth with corruption and be able to nip it at the bud before it even happens, okay. we really oh. then must, you know, uh, uh, then uh, ensure that we actually uh, pass this whistleblower uh, protection bill okay. and give oh, Kenyans yes. that much needed confidence, that assurance that when they come forth to uh, report cases of corruption, yeah. then they yeah. will be protected. All right. As we wind up on this, Madam Kamau, what more does the ODPP need to win this war against corruption? As your closing remarks. Like I've already said, the DPP is doing so, so much. We are building capacity that is hiring, training, and facilitating in terms of equipment that is needed. Yeah, but what is missing? What more do you need? Uh, we are leveraging on building the relationship with yeah. the other agencies because uh, criminal justice is a chain. And it's said that a chain is as strong as its weakest ring. So if we, even if we have a very strong ODPP yeah. and we have a weak investigative agency, we are still very weak. If we have a strong investigative agency, a strong ODPP, and a weak judiciary, the chain is very is still the, as 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 its weakest. So we need to bring all those team prayers together yeah. and strengthen them. Like we said, if a case starts today, mm -hmm. it will go on and on. It's provided for in the Anti Corruption and Economic Crimes Act yeah. that corruption cases should proceed on a day to day basis. So we will not hear that the investigative agency is not able to bring all the witnesses to be heard on a day to day. Mm -hmm. We will not hear that the magistrate have got other cases that they are hearing and this case will have to stall. We will not hear that the prosecutor is away because like we say, the prosecution will be a team, yeah. just like the defense is also coming up with its 30 advocates. The DPP should also at least even come with the 10 advocates. Yeah. And with that, we will be able to move. Okay. Again, like Mr. Gashoka said, it's not just the investigative agencies, the DPP and the judiciary. Even all Kenyans have got a role to play in adding, in adding corruption. We wouldn't yeah. have big enough jails to accommodate everybody. Mm. We also feel bad when we are working on this scam. Yeah. Even before we finish, we hear another one is in the cooking. So we would also expect, the, like Shira said, if the reporting to be done, 
uh, even before it happens. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to, okay. uh, like my parting shot, that let it be nipped at the bud yeah. even before it happens. In the countries that we have gone for benchmarking, yeah. they are doing very, very well because of their uh, preventive uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. They do not allow it to happen. You, the, as we go after the, uh, we, we go when the horses have already bolted. Okay. We close the stable when it has bolted. So we would also like to all the agencies that are involved with the prevention to work yeah. on the prevention. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, closing remarks on this. And who should bear the ultimate responsibility from where you stand? Now, first of all, I'd say we are the lead agency under the UNICAC, under that convention. Mm. It is the ESCC that is supposed to lead the fight against corruption. We cannot run away from that and we are taken up that all, uh, seriously. Two, we will not be able as a country able to achieve vision 2030 or the big four agenda unless we fight corruption. And therefore as ACC, that is why we have taken a three pronged strategy as my closing remarks. Yeah. One, prosecution of high impact cases. Two, asset recovery. And that one, because we have realized that is what is the corrupt fear, losing that property. And I said the jurisdiction is very good. And then finally, we also need to have prevention measures. And what we are doing, we have a department of prevention and we do systems analysis. We have done Ministry of Rad, Ministry of Health. What is lacking, and this is what I uh, uh, want to engage the members of parliament on that. NY, after, before NYS1, we had done a system analysis of NYS. Mm. And we said these are the reports. We give them a report. We have a report on our desk on Kemsa, which was not done this year, saying, these are the gaps in your procurement, in your warehousing, but we don't have that power as ECC to enforce those reports. And some of the recommendations we have made to Parliament is that we need to be given powers as ECC. Once we make recommendations that Ministry of Rights, we have been there, we have said these are the loopholes. If once we get that power, we can be able to go and enforce and say, if you don't enforce our report, mm -hmm. there will be some sanctions. And finally, as we said, ethics. We have a national training academy. We are training public officers. We are training all of us who would want us to, to, you know, to embrace ethics. Yeah. And that academy is up and running and we are hoping that uh, and we have recommended let's start teaching ethics. Mm -hmm. And we have developed very good materials okay. from right from standard one all the way. Okay. Dr. Mado, your closing remarks? Well, my closing remarks would be for the youth, yeah. you know. We need to keep on empowering uh, the youth so that we see more and more young parliamentarians who help us fight corruption. Secondly, we need the youth to bring social media. So social media with the youth bring in the right messaging against corruption. And thirdly and lastly, we need more and more innovation to be brought about by the youth. Blockchain solutions, artificial intelligence, and UNODC can help along with the UN development system. If we did all these three things in the next four years, would be recovering, regaining this 8% of GDP that is lost to corruption. Okay. Sheila? Trevor, allow me to, maybe because of the theme, you know, recovering with integrity, and one of the things that we have been emphasizing right now is the way we deal with COVID-19 now, the accountability measures we put in place will determine how we recover as a country. Already we're in the, we're in the, we're in the deep end of the woods, so it will be good, um, and it's good that we have ESCC and ODPP here, because I think before the end of the year, it will be good for Kenyans to just close the year with some hope that um, the, the COVID-19 entrepreneurs are those responsible for theft of public resources at, at this very critical moment of this country's uh, at, at this country uh, will be brought to book. So I am happy Commissioner Gashoka has talked about the progress that they have made in some of those cases, but it will be good to just get timelines yeah. and, and know yeah. when Kenyans um, can expect justice because that would be important. I think the Auditor General had also said that she's going to be giving a report of an independent audit conducted of all funds advanced for the COVID-19 COVID response efforts. That, is also, that should also come out before the end of this year. But we close the year uh, uh, for, for Kenyans, we, giving them a lot of hope um, as, as we've talked about NYS1 and NYS2, you know, one thing came to mind that we never seem to learn from past corruption scandals. And if we've not learned from the, the, the first phase of COVID-19, we are now going into this second phase, this second uh, so-called second wave. And we're going to see uh, more procurements uh, uh, be, be being conducted to ensure that Kenyan frontline health workers are protected. But what are the risks that we're going to see more uh, new corruption cases, the same kind of corruption uh, because we have not insulated our systems against the, the, the pilferage 
of, of public resources uh, right. at this at this critical point. So I think as much as we've talked about a lot of you know enforcement efforts, one of the things I think for me really the missing link in this country is that we do not focus on prevention efforts as much. So the issues around um, ensuring that we elect leaders of integrity, yeah. um, you know, looking into the future, looking into 2022, I'm um, ensuring that these leaders are vetted as per the aspirations of Chapter Six of our Constitution. That is really really critical because we we can't expect to prevent corruption when we have leaders who are not uh, people of integrity. And in fact, if you look at many of these leaders who are now facing uh, uh, court court actions, uh, who have been arraigned in court, people who are now at the subject of active investigation cases, they're leaders who are named by the ESCC in 2017 as people who should not be cleared uh, to vie for office because they had unresolved ethical issues. Yeah. And we also yeah. named them as civil society. But unfortunately, they were cleared. IBC gave them the, 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 the tickets to run for office, and now they have, you know, um, got another opportunities to steal from Kenyans. So there, there are certain things we need to do. We need to have a stringent vetting mechanism yeah. come 2022. Yeah. Because for me, it also needs to start from our leadership, okay. but also overall, I think also investing in a behavior change model for the country, understanding the psychology um, of corruption, as well as we are also able to instill uh, 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 that a system of, of, of values, you know, as enshrined in Article 10 of our Constitution yeah. on, on, yeah. on the national values. And I'm happy what, uh, with what Commissioner Gashoka has talked about, you know, just about even instilling, you know, ethics and values uh, from, you know, among children and our youth. I think that's a very good place to start. Okay. But we really yeah. need to institute a, 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 some, some, we need to have a program right. for behavior right. change that will translate from the individual the uh, institutional to the societal level. Thank okay. you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have to leave it there because of time. Uh, Sheila Masinde, Executive Director, Transparency International, thank you so much for making time. Dr. Amado Philip De Andre, UNODC Regional Representative, Eastern Africa, thank you so much for making time. Thank you. Joseph Mwaniki Gashoka, ESCC Commissioner, Sante Sana for coming through, and Emily Kamau, Deputy Director, Department of Economic Organizing and International Crimes at the ODPP. Thank you so much for making time. Let's see if we can squeeze in some quick comments before we call it uh, night. Robert Josochi says corruption in Kenya is already a politicized issue and the legal system is blind to procedural procurement laws that are skewed by design. Socially, it has equally been accepted as Mutuetu syndrome which results in a messed up economic system. Let's see here, you call yourself Governor the Dreamer. You say, make corruption a predominantly economic and political issue rather than a predominantly legal, social, or ethical issue. Let's see here. Miano Munene says, ask ODPP and EACC why it is so difficult to pin down and prosecute corrupt officials at MOH. I think they've spoken about that. Despite high-level corruption, not a single file has ODPP approved for prosecution. Whom are they scared of? That is a question that... She had already addressed earlier on. Engineer Lazaro Kanyambok says, slaying the dragon of corruption proves to be a tall order to this side of the world. Corruption high priests hold so powerful positions in the government that they cannot be prosecuted easily and they're very influential. Bob Ruddy says, corruption in Kenya won't ever be healed when we still have a, a rot in the judicial system. It's like, living, it's like our living style in this country. Let's see, Akip Pleting Manuela says, what happened to the list of shame? How many of those accused have been charged? All right. Brian Okech says, as citizens, we are also at fault when it comes to fighting corruption. We want prosecution, yet we always sympathize with the culprits. We rally behind accused government officials and politicians, making it hard to move forward in this fight. Let me see if I can squeeze in two more. Nyamogo Gogni says, why should the government with enough evidence lose a graft case against a public servant because he or she has money and can hire the best lawyer in town? All right. Let's see the final one here. Arnold Odur says, indeed, our country has a lot of ground to cover in terms of winning the war against corruption, but it would be reckless to suggest that we are losing or even that there is no progress. All right. That's where we leave it for now. Kenya joins the world in marking the world under corruption day on Wednesday. That's on the 9th. Theme is recover with integrity. We'll see how that turns out and the recommendations that will come from that engagement. My name is Trevor Mbija. Always a pleasure having you with us. Let's do this again next week on Monday. And thank you so much for your feedback. Good night. And I insist, Merry Christmas. I know it's early, but Merry Christmas. Bye for now. <laughs>